so today we discuss about the primary sedimentary structures that is the structures formed by uh, sedimentary processes now uh, the study of sedimentary structures uh, this study has got immense importance among geologists and particularly to the sedimentologists from the 1950s and onwards geologists of uh, that time uh, and onwards they try to find the processes which are uh, cause for the formation of these primary sedimentary structures and they found that there are some physical processes which are occurring during the time of deposition of sediments and soon after so they call them as primary sedimentary structures now the primary sedimentary structures are immense importance because they give us informations about the medium in which the sediments are transported and deposited in a basin that is the nature of the medium whether they are carried by wind water or glacier the secondly the mode of transport that is whether they are carried by suspension whether they are carried by saltation or by bed load and there is another type of transportation that is by solution that is a um, chemical that is a sediment which uh, dissolved in the solvent so by solution a sediment or a chemical component can transport from its source rock to the depositional condition where it get deposited when suitable condition achieved and finally the energy condition of the medium as we know that uh, during decreasing energy condition throughout the path of the flowing medium as the energy condition of the medium decreases it results deposition of coarser particles so by observing the textural properties of the deposition we can get an idea about the energy condition of the medium energy condition means the depth of the uh, water flow velocity uh, turbulence and these kind of things now the sedimentary structures all those previous points that is the medium energy condition of the uh, medium uh, just one second so all these conditions the medium uh, that is the nature of medium energy conditions uh, all those things particularly indicate or we finally want to know about the depositional environment that is the environment where the sedimentary deposition occurs uh, most structures are formed in the in recent day phenomena and we know by studying those structures we know how they are formed and in which sedimentary environment they are likely to be formed or they are forming so from the present day experience we imply them in the rock record and if in the rock record we get similar kinds of uh, primary sedimentary structures then we can say that these structures are formed for a particular depositional condition and a particular depositional setup so from the present we get the experience and imply it in the rock record now petijon and potter in 1964 they defined primary sedimentary structures first so they defined uh, this primary sedimentary structures are the sedimentary structures 
which formed at the time of the deposition that is during deposition or soon after the deposition but this structure must form prior lithification that means prior consolidation or prior rock transformation prior getting to solidification of those sediments so primary sedimentary structures formed during sedimentation or soon after sedimentation but before solidification all those structures are named as or called as primary sedimentary structures now this primary sedimentary structures can be formed by some physical processes um, those are called uh, physical processes by deposition those are called depositional structures some structures are formed uh, due to erosion of a pre-existing sediment deposition those are called erosional sedimentary structures and some structures formed after the deposition of the sediments due to some sort of uh, penny contemporaneous deformation but again keep in mind that this penny contemporaneous deformation occurs after the deposition of sediments but before lithification of the sediments so here we get three kinds of sedimentary structures that is depositional sedimentary structures uh, erosional sedimentary structures and penny contemporaneous deformational sedimentary structures apart from these there are some other kinds of sedimentary structures found in nature those are found by organic activity so those are called organic sedimentary structures okay now there are various ways uh, one can classify the sedimentary structures there is no particular strict rule of classifying sedimentary structures so one can classify the process involved for the formation of sedimentary structures like i previously told there's depositional structures erosional structures penny contemporaneous deformational structures uh, organic governed sedimentary structures like those so in that case the process is the main factor sometimes genesis will be the uh, factor by which we can classify the sedimentary structures like those formed um, before deposition uh, those formed before uh, solidification that means those formed during uh, the time of deposition and those formed after uh, deposition so this way sometimes we emphasis on the processes involved for the formation of sedimentary structures sometimes we involve uh, we focus on the genesis involved for the formation of sedimentary structures here i show you a classification scheme of sedimentary structures on the basis of whether there is some organic activity is responsible for the formation of sediment structures or not so i divide into two groups the first one is the inorganic sedimentary structures as the name itself suggests that in this type there is no organic activity present or responsible for the formation of those sedimentary structures so these are entirely formed by the physical processes that occur during or uh, soon after the deposition and in the second type these are organic sedimentary structures that means these sedimentary structures formed by the guidance of the organic bodies which present in that condition like the marine organisms present uh, in the marine condition like those so in general the inorganic sedimentary structures 
they are categorized into two groups if i considered it as a layer so a layer has three dimension as we all know uh, this is the top surface or the horizontal uh, planar area planar surface and these are the two sides two vertical planes okay. so depending on in which surface these sedimentary structures occurring these inorganic primary sedimentary structures are categorized into two groups the first one is the surface features that means occurs in the top or bottom of this layer and the second group is the bedding features that is except the top and bottom surface all other surface this surface this surface in this surface if any sedimentary structures formed and preserved these are called bedding features or within bed features so two groups one is the surfacial features which formed in these areas that is the top surface and similarly in the bottom surface and second one is the bedding features which formed in this uh, within bed that is in the vertical uh, portions of the bed we can see those structures now studying with the simplest sedimentary structures or the most basic sedimentary structures is the planar bedding now the planar bedding if i consider a sedimentary deposition uh, as a layer then the deposition of a particular physical chemical condition of deposition that means sediments deposited at a particular physical chemical condition of the uh, medium as well as the carrying sediments that particular physical chemical condition indicating depositional layer is called bed or lamina so basically a bed or lamina that means a sedimentary layer indicates a particular hydrodynamic condition of deposition you can say hydrodynamic condition of deposition or alternatively you can say physical chemical condition of deposition so a layer which indicates particular hydrodynamic condition of deposition is called a sedimentary bed bed or lemon now this definition of bed or lamini it is first proposed in 1953 by mackey now previously i told you that a sedimentary layer which indicates a particular physical chemical uh, mineralogical biological composition they are called bed or lamini now how can you distinguish a bed or lamini does both bed and lamini mean same yes in one sense they both mean same in terms of indicating a particular physical chemical condition of deposition but we differentiate a bed and a lamini depending on their thickness so when a sedimentary layer is greater than 1 cm thick we call them bed and when a sedimentary layer is less than 1 cm thick we call them lamin so you can see in this picture that there are some units like this one this red stripe portion this sedimentary layer is definitely above 1 cm thick and it indicates a particular physical chemical condition of deposition so we can call them as bed but in the <coughs> bottom portion of this layer there are some layerings which are very fine that means less than 1 cm thick so we call them as lamini now the question comes that how did you 
separate two successive beds that is how did I separate uh, this bed from this lemmy as the definition tells you that a bed or lemony indicates a particular physical chemical condition of deposition so definitely from one bed to another bed the physical chemical condition of deposition is changed and due to this change in hydrodynamic condition or changing physical chemical condition condition the nature of depositional sediments are also changed that means they are uh, size shape shorting uh, roundness ferricity arrangement porosity all these textural properties of the depositional sediments they are changed with changing environment condition and not only the sedimentary texture the sedimentary composition mineral composition that are also changed so as the hydrodynamic conditions of the depositional medium changed of the hydrodynamic condition of the flowing medium is changed the nature of the carrying sediments is also changed that means their uh, chemical composition as well as the texture of those sediments they are also changed so in different layers which indicates different hydrodynamic condition of deposition they will deposit different chemical composition of minerals and different texture condition of sediments sometimes the mineralogical composition can be same but definitely with changing hydrodynamic condition sedimentary texture is always changing so that is why you in the successive sedimentary layers if you consider the mineralogical composition and texture you will get difference between those two successive layers say for example this whitish layer and the above blackish layer you can clearly see that the color of these two layers are different so that indicates the chemical composition the mineralogical composition of this whitish layer is different from the mineralogical composition of this blackish layer so you can see that the mineralogical composition is different and from the previous classes we can understand that these mineralogical differences will also result in textural differences the mineralogical physical and chemical stability of minerals they will guide how my sedimentary textures will be so the different mineralogical composition in these two layers the whitish layer and this blackish layer with differing mineralogical composition sedimentary texture is also different so we can identify a sedimentary layer or a bed or a lamine simply by observing the changing mineralogical composition of two successive layers or changing textural properties of two successive layers mind it mineralogical composition can change or cannot change but with successive depositional bed or lamine the textural properties will always change so in this way we can identify sedimentary layerings now those layerings which are greater than one centimeter thick they are called beds those layering which are less than one centimeter thick they are called lamine now depending on thickness those uh, beds are named with different names 
so as i already told when the thickness is less than one centimeter they are called as lamini when thickness is one to three centimeters they are very thin bed three to ten thin bed ten to thirty centimeter medium bed thirty to hundred centimeter that means one meter they are thick bed and above one meter they are known as very thick bed in lamini they are also classified according to their thickness when thickness is less than one millimeter they are, is known as very thin lamini one to three millimeter thin lamini three to ten medium ten to thirty thick and thirty to hundred millimeter it is known as very thick lamini so this differentiation of bed and lamini names are depending on the thickness of the individual layers now here i show you a panel diagram in which the bed or laminis they are differentiated depending upon some characters firstly they are differentiated whether the bounding surfaces that means the top and bottom surfaces of a layer they are parallel or not that means parallel or non parallel here you can see the uh, two lines are parallel to each other and in this picture you can see that the two lines this line and this line are not parallel to each other they are gradually diverging from each other so the x axis is indicating the parallelism of the bounding surfaces the top and bottom surfaces and in the y axis it is shown whether the bounding surfaces are straight that means even whether bounding surfaces are curly that means wavy and whether the bounding surfaces are broadly gently curved or rounded that is known as curved so depending on these two properties the sedimentary layers that means bed and laminis are differentiated now each group there are against two groups one is continuous and one is discontinuous so in the first group the bounding layers the bounding surfaces of the sedimentary layer is parallel they are even that means straight and they are continuous in the second case they are parallel even but discontinuous they are not continuously found here in the right hand portion of non parallel portion the bounding surfaces are non parallel but they are even that means straight and continuous in this picture the bounding surfaces are non parallel they are even that means straight but discontinuous they are not continuous bodies in the second row the bounding surfaces are curly that means wavy they are even sorry their uh, bounding surfaces are curly they are parallel to each other these curly bounding surfaces are parallel to each other and continuous in the second case bounding surfaces are parallel but discontinuous and obviously they are curly in the in this picture the bounding surfaces are curly or wavy they are continuous but they are these bounding surfaces are not parallel to each other here bounding surfaces are wavy discontinuous and non parallel in the bottom most row the bounding surfaces are curved all the bounding surfaces are curved but they are parallel and continuous in this picture the bounding surfaces are curved they are discontinuous but parallel here the bounding surfaces are curved they are continuous but not parallel to each other in this picture bounding surfaces are curved they are discontinuous and they are non parallel that means not the bounding surfaces are not parallel to each other so depending on the nature of bounding surfaces whether they are parallel whether they are uh, even or whether they are continuous on these three properties a sedimentary layer can be grouped in these 12 varieties 
now after sedimentary bedding another sedimentary structure that is primary sedimentary structures comes in our study that is ripple mars here you can see in this figure the ripple mars that is these undulatory surfaces on the top of the uh, bed the top surface or the bottom surface which separates one bed from another bed those are called bedding place that means that i called previously as bounding surfaces so the bounding surfaces of a uh, bed is called bedding plane similarly the bounding surfaces of a lamine is called lamination plane now these ripple marks are smooth gently undulations found on the top of the bedding plane so this feature is a surface feature and found on the top surface of the bed now this ripple marks as a primary sedimentary structures they are very useful they are used particularly to index indicate the direction of the flow uh, of air and water these ripple marks can be formed by unidirectional current that means medium moving from one direction to another or these can formed by bidirectional current that means the current is moving in both direction at a time so by studying the ripple marks they can indicate the direction of the flowing medium that is whether they are unidirectional or whether they are bidirectional current secondly these ripple marks can give you indication about the stratigraphic top that means which way of the rock record is younging okay that is the law of superposition can be well established from this sedimentary structure thirdly these ripple marks will tell you about the strength of the flowing medium particularly the wind and water that means the energy condition of the uh, flowing medium so with changing energy condition changing strength of the flowing medium some definite uh, morphology some definite characters of this feature will change that i explain later in few slides now if i try to draw a transverse section of that ripple mars this section is draw parallel to the flow direction so flow direction is from my left to right that is the uh, flow direction okay uh, so this section is drawn from uh, parallel to flow direction and it's a vertical section now if i draw a vertical section of any ripple mark then there are several points or several uh, features within this ripple marks that we have to study firstly the from this cross section you can see that there is a gently sloping portion the inclination of this surface is gentle that means shallow and there is a st steeply sloping portion the inclination of this surface is higher compared to this surface so this surface inclination this angle is um, low or less in amount compared to the this amount so that indicates the inclination of this surface is higher compared to the this surface this gently sloping surface is known as the stoss site s t o double -S, s this this one this gently sloping surface is the known as the stoss side of a ripple mass whereas the steeply sloping slide is known as the lee side l double -E. The steeply sloping portion is known as the lee side so the gently sloping side is known as toss side and the steeply sloping portion of the ripple mark is known as the lee side now within this 
ripple mark cross section of uh, ripple mark you can find that there are two points one which is highest in altitude compared to this bottom uh, bounding surface this bottom bounding surface and one point which is lowest compared to the bottom bounding surface so this point and this point now the point which is highest in altitude and this point indicates the maximum amount of curvature and the surface above which this point rest is convex upward this point is known as summit point or often it is known as crest point c r e s t uh, crest point okay so the maximum altitude point within the ripple marks which has the maximum amount of curvature and that surface is convex upward this point is known as the crest point similarly the least altitude point at the lowest point within the ripple mass also this point has the maximum amount of curvature and this point rests on a concave upward surface concave upward surface this surface that is concave upward that point is known as the trough point so the this point is known as crest point and this point is known as trough point now during the movement of the flowing medium a sediment grain move from this direction to this direction in this for this particular feature from left to right now is when a sediment move upwards along this gently sloping stoss side they after crossing the crest point they came to a point here where it separates from this surface to the from the gently sloping surface to the uh, steeply sloping surface so a grain gradually rolls up uh, along the stoss side here it separates from this side from the stoss side and falls in the uh, steeply inclined portion this point which separates the flow from the gently sloping surface to the steeply sloping surface this point is known as the brink point so the brink point separates the flow from the gently sloping stoss side to the steeply sloping lee side similarly here you get another point which is known as toe point this toe point separates this steeply slope portion which is known as the slip face this portion here you can see this is the slip face this is the maximum amount steep end portion in the lee side uh, the toe point separates the uh, slip face from the bottom set that means from this portion this trap point region portion the toe point separates this slip face from the bottom set now if we consider this side the leeward side of a ripple mark so you can get basically the lee side is uh, consist of two surfaces one is the uh, slip face and another is the bottom set and this portion that is from the crest point to brink point this portion is known as the top set <clears throat> so from crest point to brink point portion is known as the top set from brink point to toe point portion is known as the slip face and from toe point to trap point portion is known as the bottom set so top set slip face bottom set Okay. Now, two successive troughs 
the distance between two this is one trough point and this is another trough point the distance between two successive trough point is known as the ripple length okay. and the height is the vertical distance between the two point or oh, sorry between the trough point and the crest point that is if i draw a horizontal line from the crest points this vertical distance is known as the height of the ripple or altitude of the ripple or you can draw it here also here also that means the distance from the trough point to the crest point that is the maximum altitude maximum amount of height you can get from this transverse profile so that is known as ripple height so ripple length is the distance from two successive trough points or you can call it two successive crest points that is from one crest point is here another crest point is uh, something uh, here will be so ripple length can be measured between two successive crest points but mind it two successive and or ripple length can be measured between two successive trough points ripple altitude or ripple height is the maximum amount distance between the trough point and the crest point now so this perpendicular line drawing from the crest point on the basal surface that perpendicular line is basically separates the ripple into two half one part belonging the stoss side and one part belonging the lee side now if someone asked you to measure the length of the stoss side so stoss you can measure the length of the stoss side by this inclined surface gently inclined surface and similarly the length of the lee side can be measured by this along the uh, steeply inclined surface now if these two inclined surfaces are projected horizontally on this bottom substrate so this point will be projected here this point will be projected here this point will be projected here so we get an horizontal projection of the stoss side over these bounding surfaces this is known as the length of the horizontal projection of stoss side this portion the length of the horizontal projection of stoss side similarly this portion is known as the length of the horizontal projection of the lee side that means all the successive uh, lee surface points they are projected on the uh, bottom horizontal bounding surfaces so from that we get the length of the horizontal projection of the lee side and together this horizontal projection of stoss side and horizontal projection of lee side together if we add them they will indicate or they will um, give us the ripple length you can see that i started from this trough point to the crest point that is the horizontal projection of the stoss side now the from crest point to the next trough point that is the horizontal projection of trough point so if we add these two we get the distance from this trough point to this trough point so we can get the by adding the horizontal projection of stoss side to the horizontal projection of lee side we can get the ripple length now we can also measure whether the ripple is symmetric or asymmetric that means whether the length of the stoss side is same with the length of the lee side that means the horizontal projection of stoss side is same with the horizontal projection of lee side so basically it's a ratio of the horizontal projection of the stoss side to the horizontal projection of the lee side horizontal projection of the stoss side and the horizontal projection of lee side 
if they are symmetric that means the horizontal projection of stoss side is equals to horizontal projection of lee side then they will give the ratio value is 1 and if it is asymmetric that means if the horizontal projection of stoss side is greater than horizontal projection of lee side then the value will be greater than 1 keep in mind that always the stoss side will be greater than or equals to lee side lee side will not ever be higher in values in with respect to the stoss side stoss side will always have higher length or it may some be equal with the lee side value but never stoss side will never be lesser in uh, distance or length with respect to lee side okay so if stoss side length is equals to lee side length my ripple symmetry index that ratio is one if it is greater than the lee side my ripple symmetry index or the ratio is greater than one now from this ripple symmetry index we can say whether the ripple is current ripple or wave ripple so here from the ripple symmetry index we divide or we classify ripple marks onto two groups one group is current ripple where the stoss side length is greater than lee side length that means ripple symmetry index is greater than one and second group of ripple is the wave ripple where the ripple symmetry index is close to one now mathematically the ripples in when the ripple symmetry index value is between 1 to 2.5 that is up to 2.5 ripple symmetry index those are considered as wave ripple or symmetric ripple and above 2.5 that is whereas the ripple symmetry index value is greater than 3 those ripples are considered as current ripple why these two uh, values are for symmetric ripple the values is considered up to 2.5 that will i will discuss later uh, another property which can be measured from this uh, cross vertical profile of ripple that is the ripple index ripple index is simply the ratio between the stoss side length that is the length from the two successive trap points it's the ratio between the uh, ripple index is the ratio of stoss side length uh, um, uh, ratio of the ripple length to the ripple altitude that means ripple length by ripple height and it is found that for current ripples for asymmetrical ripples in which the stoss side length is higher than lee side length for current ripples ripple index values ranging from 8 to 20 and for wave ripples that is for symmetrical ripples ripple index value ranging from up to 4 or 6 so from these two values if we simply don't observe all those things simply by measuring some values if we calculate the ripple symmetry index or ripple index we can firmly say whether the ripple is asymmetric that means current ripple or whether the ripple is symmetric that means wave ripple now here you can see the two figures of asymmetric ripple and uh, symmetric ripple that is a block diagram here you can clearly see that the stoss side this side is larger in length compared to this side and not only that the inclination of the two sides stoss side and lee side are also different the inclination value is stoss side is gentler for this kind for the, this current ripple compared to the lee side okay so the flow direction for this kind of asymmetrical ripple or this kind of asymmet uh, this kind of current ripple is always from stoss to lee side keep in mind the flow direction for asymmetrical ripple is from stoss to lee 
so for in this figure the stoss side is in your right hand side and lee side is in your left hand side so my flow direction is from right to left so that is an asymmetrical ripple or you can call it as a current ripple and this kind of ripple marks can be formed by unidirectional flow that means the flow is from particularly from one direction to other whereas in contrast there is another kind of ripple in which you can see the length of the one side is almost same with the length of the other side and also the inclination of these two sides are also almost same so these kinds of ripples are known as symmetrical ripple and they are formed by bidirectional flow that means the flow sometimes goes this direction sometimes goes this direction this oscillatory movement back and forth back and forth this oscillatory movement is the result of this kind of flow and that is formed due to wave action so these ripples are known as symmetrical ripple or wave ripple the useful of this kind of wave ripple is its pointed tip that is the crest point the crest point is sharply pointed you can see the crest point is sharply pointed whereas the trough points are broadly rounded so this pointed crest point is always indicate the stratigraphic top direction from this pointed crest point we can say the stratigraphic top direction which direction is my up from the stratigraphic uh, column from the rock record but from the current ripple you cannot say the stratigraphic top direction instead you can say the flow direction that is the flow direction from right to left so two types of information we can get from the current ripple and wave ripple from current ripple we can get the flow direction by their asymmetric nature that is flow from stoss side to lee side and from wave ripple we can say the stratigraphic top that is the pointed tip pointed crest point will indicate the stratigraphic top side now depending on the crest line morphology that means that if i consider the successive crest point we can get the uh, crest lines depending on this crest line morphology uh, we can classify ripples on different types that means whether the crest line are straight that can this mainly this classification is for the asymmetrical ripples but sometimes symmetrical ripple can also show these kinds of uh, ripple crest line nature uh, the crest lines are straight transverse that means flow direction is from bottom to top for all these figures it is considered that the flow direction is from bottom to top and you can see the crest lines are transverse to the flow direction but here you can see the crest lines are parallel to each other which are called straight crest lines crest lines are curvy or wavy in nature that is called sinus in phase that is sinus curvy and parallel in nature here you can see that crest lines are sinus but not parallel to each other so sinus out of phase here the crest lines are cup shaped but the cups opening is towards the flow direction so these kinds of ripples are known as catenary ripples catenary here is uh, the cups the curvatures are parallel to each other and that is catenary in phase here also the catenary ripple but catenary out of phase the surfaces are the crest lines are not parallel to each other in the bottom left figure the opening of crest lines is in the up current sign that is opposite to the flow direction nature flow direction is from bottom to top and the opening of these um, crest lines is opposite to the flow direction uh, these kinds of crest line morphology uh, showing ripple marks are called lingoid but mind it here the crest lines becomes isolated that means these are almost single ripples the crest lines are not jointed in lingoid ripple 
almost same type is the cuspid type but here the crest lines are joined together that means here the crest lines are continuous here the crest lines for lingual ripple the crest lines are discontinuous so the same thing the cup shaped um, ripple crest lines whose openings is opposite to the fluid direction but continuous crest lines these ripples are known as cuspid ripples and the discontinuous cup shaped crest lines uh, the here the crest lines are discontinuous not connected to each other not connected with each other and the opening of this cup shapes are towards the flow direction towards flow direction these kinds of ripples are known as lunate ripples okay so catenary and you can see catenary or cuspid ripples are almost same here both the uh, cups are connected with each other that means continuous crest lines but the openings of these cups is different for catenary and cuspid for catenaries it is towards the flow direction for cuspid it is opposite to the flow direction so that's all for today the remaining part of the sedimentary texture will be continued in the next class thank you